Good evening, each one. I invite you to take your Bibles out, please. Be opening to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. We have recently been looking at the churches of Asia addressed by Christ Himself there. There's seven of them. That's not the totality of the churches that were located in Asia, but these are the seven that Jesus Christ wanted to address at the time that John penned this final book of the New Testament. Revelation chapter 2 is where we're going to be focusing the majority of our time here in just a moment. It's good to have each one present tonight. We had some that were away this morning that are back tonight. Good to have the Jackson family with us, the Halls with us. Good to see Brother Camden uh, back as well and the rest that have returned, of course, especially those visiting. But Revelation 2, we read about the church in Thyatira, the corrupt church. Verses 18 through the end of the chapter, through verse 29, let's read together what Jesus Christ had to say to these saints. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations." He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so the church located in the city of Thyatira. This is a map of Paul's third journey, but perhaps it was on the second journey, as I encircled Thyatira in purple there, but perhaps it was on the second journey that it was began, that the work there began or was started and established, as we pointed out with some of the other churches we've studied so far where we don't specifically read of Paul or Peter or someone else going there to preach the gospel specifically. But we do read in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 10, when Paul was in Asia, and this is one of the cities of, as you see, of Asia, that all who were in Asia heard the word of the Lord. And so perhaps it was at this time that a church was established there in Thyatira. They did receive the longest letter of the seven. And we know as we study about Thyatira from here, but also what we know from history they, fa they face pressure from within as well as from without to conform to the world. And other than what is written here in Revelation chapter 2, little else is known about the church. As we see a kind of a bigger picture of what we're talking about here of the, the seven churches of Asia, as we have looked at Laodicea, in Philadelphia and Sardis, and now tonight, Thyatira. And modern day, Turkey, of course, is where these ancient cities, where these seven churches of Asia were located. 
that was spelt for some reason with an E, so I kind of put an A over. That's why it looks a little messy there. But I, don't, I looked it up to see if that's how they spell it in, uh, in Turkey, and that's not how they spell it. So I think that was just a misspelling. But again, modern day Turkey and um, certainly these uh, seven churches of Asia, we, we, there's, there's groups that go over to visit these sites, including members of the church that have been over there to see them uh, and the ancient ruins of these places. And just a few pictures just quickly to, to share with you about that. This is the recently, somewhat recently, reconstructed stoa, S-T-O-A of Thyatira. A stoa in Greek architecture is a freestanding colonnade or covered walkway. And here is the theater of Thyatira. And then just uh, kind of a variety of ancient ruins there in Thyatira. So we th what we do know about the city of Thyatira is that it was a small city and politically the least important of the seven cities. This is something that was emphasized over and over in what I've read in, in preparing for this lesson. Its main purpose, though, was an outpost for Pergamos in case there was an invasion. And so it was a military stronghold for Rome, which was often then the first city that was attacked by the enemy. And we know that it was frequently destroyed, and so it was then frequently rebuilt. Caesar's elite guard was stationed there. Their job was to hold off the enemy long enough for the other cities to prepare for battle. It was under Roman rule for around 300 years. Pliny the Elder wrote Thyatira and other unimportant cities. Now, who was this Pliny or Pliny the Elder? He was a Roman author. He was a naturalist. He was a natural philosopher. He was a naval and army commander of the early Roman Empire. He was a friend of the Emperor Vespasian. And he wrote the Encyclopedic uh, Naturalist Historia, which became an editorial model for encyclopedias later. But he lived in, from the years 23 A.D. to 79 A.D. So that puts him at the time of Christ and the time of the apostles. But again, that's what they thought of the city of Thyatira. It was among the more unimportant cities. And stated here in this work as well of the archaeology of the New Testament cities, the city of Thyatira, which is modern Akasar in Turkey, is said to be the least of important city among the seven mentioned the book of Revelation. Yamamuchi uh, quotes Pliny the elder statement about Thyatira in the Roman period as a city of no first rate dignity. But it was strategically situated on a main road that ran between Pergamum and Laodicea. Philadelphia was also on this road. Most travel was through the valleys this road, which was part of, quote, the imperial, imperial post road linking Italy, Greece, Asia Minor with Egypt, gave it commercial importance. Archaeology has uncovered many Thyatarian coins indicating a thriving commercial system. In fact, Thyatira was among the first cities to use money, and much of the knowledge that we do have of ancient Thyatira comes from the images found on these coins. Again, commercially speaking, inscriptions and coins show that Thyatira was noted for its many trade guilds, roughly equivalent to our labor unions. And from this particular work, quote, there are references to unions of clothers, bakers, tanners, potters, linen workers, wool merchants, slave traders, coppersmiths, and dyers. So there's more trade guilds were listed in this city than any other city in the region. It was known for its highly organized trade union of workers, again, in wool, linen, leather, bronze, potters, tanners, bakers, slavers, and dyers. Each guild was associated, and this is an important point, that did affect, no doubt, the church and those who came out of this background into the church of the Lord there in Thyatira. But each guild was associated with a god or goddess in idolatrous practices. In fact, pagan religions had penetrated and pervaded those trade guilds. 
Thyatira specialized in purple dye made from the madder root of or from the more expensive dye extract, extracted excuse me, from oysters. Well, Thyatira, that probably rings a bell, doesn't it? Book of Acts, chapter 16. It's, this city was the home of Paul's first convert in Philippi. As we read in Acts 16, 14, as Luke records for us, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to th heed the things spoken by Paul and her and her household obeyed the gospel. So could it be that they went back and spoke shared the gospel with those in Thyatira and because of these first converts in Philippi that Paul, Silas, and Timothy and Luke taught, perhaps it was then, perhaps it was later as we mentioned in Acts 19 when Paul spent so much time in the area of Asia. But obviously the gospel went there and a church was planted. But here are the first converts, Lydia and her household, which connects to the commercial trade uh, that was located there. William Barclay, scholar and commentator, he said there were more trade guilds in Thyatira than in any other town of its size in Asia. The problem which faced every Christian in Thyatira was whether they were to make money or to be Christians. And so this blend of the commercial business with religion was intertwined, kind of like what we would see in the book of Acts with uh, the temple of Diana and the silversmiths. Remember Demetrius and they made those those shrines and images, and he got all his fellow uh, silversmiths uh, worked up because of what Paul was preaching. And so there's the commercial business mixed with the religion, and that's what you found, find throughout the Roman Empire, really. But it certainly was heavy with all these trade guilds that were located in the city of Thyatira. So the Christians, of course, who lived there objected to the guilds because of the guilds' rites required all members to eat a sacrificial meal and to honor that pagan deity. And... Immorality was often associated with those banquets. And Christians who, of course, refused to participate were threatened with persecution. One of the most prominent deities at Thyatira was Ty Tyramonus, an ancient sun god, but there was also Artemis-type temple whose goddess was called Boratine. No temple to the Roman emperor was ever built there. Cosmodus says when the Romans took over the city, the emperor worship cult was united with the dominant system that was already in place. But even without a temple to the emperor, at least four Christians of Thyatira, this is mid-third century, were taken to Pergamum and martyred. Let's go to the actual text again that we read to begin our study tonight, Revelation chapter 2. Notice what Jesus had to say to this church in the city of Thyatira. But I thought some of that background information not only would be interesting, but helpful and applicable to what we find here in the text. So Thyatira, the corrupt church, we find the Lord's self-designation there in verse 18. These things says the Son of God. You know, emperor worship in Thyatira gave homage to the Roman emperor as being the Son of God or Son of a God. And here Christ is confronting that worship and what they're pressured with stating that He is who the one who is the true son of God and serving as a reminder of who is truly king of kings and lord of lords. It is Christ their savior whom they obeyed when they heard the gospel and who they're still to follow and be loyal to and have of course no other gods before him. Also he describes himself as the one who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like brass. And so with piercing vision that sees all and judges righteously, as will be touched upon later in this letter to the church in Thyatira, but feet that were firmly established and strong and able to tread upon the wicked. But the description of his eyes and feet both suggest impending judgment. 
eyes like a flame of fire, feet like fine brass. And as we find with all seven churches of Asia that Christ addresses in Revelation 2 and 3, He tells them, I know your works. And yes, even with the corrupt church, the church at Thyatira, there is a verse that is dedicated to commendation, right? And we find it here in verse 19. And just to be honest, the sin, the corruption of this church is so outstanding. It just jumps off the page with this woman called Jezebel and what's going on that we might just forget there's some good things that Jesus says about these Christians or at least some that are there in Thyatira. And he says to them, and knowing their works, I know your love. Well, at least for some of them, it would be their, would it not be their love for the Lord and for one another, how they cared for one another, unlike the church at Ephesus. Evidently, the saints in Thyatira had not left their first love because this is one of the things that Christ commends them for. I know your works. I know your love. He says, I know your service. Some translations just render it ministering. I know your ministering. That's what service is. They were servants and they, they helped each other. That's one of the things we emphasized in our lesson this morning about uh, having the mind of Christ, that He's our, our pattern. And one such uh, part of that pattern is his, his humility and His servant, servanthood and how we are to be servants, and they were. And, of course, love motivates action and ministering and rendering service, and they did that. He also says, and knowing their works, I know your faith, your fidelity, your faithfulness. Of course, without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six. 6. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Early in this chapter, he had said to the church in Smyrna, Be faithful until death, the Lord said to them, and I'll give you the crown of life. He said, I know your faith. And I know your patience. I know your long suffering, your perseverance, your steadfast endurance, the power then to withstand hardship or stress. And no doubt they were under it here in Thyatira. And that wasn't, that wasn't all. In his commendation, he also says, as for your works, the last are more than the first. Well, what does that imply? Well, that implies that they were growing, that they had spiritually progressed. They're not simply resting on the accomplishments of the past. They were doing what is expected of all of us when we obeyed the gospel that we move forward spiritually and not go backwards. Remember the Hebrew writer said, You've done, grown dull of hearing, Hebrews 5, 11. You ought to be teachers by this time, but you need someone to teach you again. Well, to those in Thyatira, maybe the majority could be described this way. Your works, they're more than they were at the beginning. And again, as I said, that's expected of all Christians. Notice, if you mark your place here in Revelation 2, please, but notice just briefly there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1, and then a couple of verses over in 2 Peter. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and, and, and verse uh, 1, he says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and please God. Abound more and more. That's what's expected of every child of God. And they had gone in the right direction. They had progressed and added to their spiritual growth. There in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, 2 Peter 1 verse 8, as he speaks to these Christians, Peter does about giving all diligence to add to your faith these various uh, Christian qualities. He says, For if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he, he ends the book in chapter 3 and verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so many other passages, of course, that emphasize as a child of God, we are to be growing. And that's indicated by Christ here that it's true and characteristic of this church. And so it, it, it's all that 
more of a contrast to read that and then the rest of it. Or at least if we could just, if we go back to Revelation 2, and we had verses, we had verse 18, verse 19, and, and then we could just come to verse 25. <laughs> we'd have a, an entirely different picture of, of the church here in Thyatira, but we can't do that because, well, there were some things that Christ had against them. And so we read of the Lord's condemnation beginning in verse 20 and following. And he begins by saying, Nevertheless, I have against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. Now, do you think that there was a sister in Christ there whose name was Jezebel? Maybe. Kind of doubt it. And do you think when Jesus identified a woman there in that church by Jezebel and started describing very specifically what she's guilty of, and others who are participating in that, that they didn't know who he was talking about? I think they knew exactly what sister, what woman in their midst Jesus was speaking about. But he says, you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now understand that it's not just she's alone guilty of what is stated here. She's teaching and seducing, Christ says, my servants. So that implies other Christians involved with this woman identified and described as being Jezebel. Now when we think about Jezebel, our minds, and this is where no doubt Christ wanted our minds, the reader, to go is this very wicked woman from the Old Testament, right? So we first are introduced to the original Jezebel in 1 Kings 16, and then her death we read about all the way later in 2 Kings chapter 9. Who was she? What do we know about her? Well, let's highlight some things just briefly. She was the daughter of Eth Bel, king of the Sidonians, and a devotee to the god Baal. She married wicked King Ahab of Israel, and the text tells us in the Old Testament that she provoked him to do more evil. Now, he was really, really bad on his own. But she stirred him up to go even further in his wickedness. And we also know that during his reign and their reign together that they built a temple to Baal. And we also know that she actively persecuted the true prophets of God. Where Obadiah, a servant of Ahab, her husband, actually hid some in, in caves, right? And, and provided uh, food for them. But she supported 450 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Asherah. In fact, some of our young people I know this morning studied the story about this, in Mount Carmel and the contest between Elijah and all these false prophets. But we know that her number one target on her hit list was this man, Elijah, right? But the Lord protected him. And you remember the story when she had Naboth murdered and confiscated his vineyard for her sulking husband because Naboth wouldn't part with his family's inheritance. And he went and pouted on his bed and she said, I'll take care of it. And so she did. And God took care of her as prophesied. And she had a rather gruesome and memorable death there in 2 Kings chapter 9 when she fell into the wrath and judgment of God. But here is a wicked, wicked woman who surpassed the wickedness of Ahab, who worshipped and served false gods, who persecuted the true prophets, and was certainly involved in various immoralities. And so you think about a sister in the Lord, in the Lord's church, that is described and identified as Jezebel. That's pretty bad. 
to say the least. And that's what they had in their midst. Now, Christ says she, she calls herself a prophetess. And so, in other words, she professed to be a mouthpiece, a spokesman for God. What, he's, what I'm saying to you is what God's revealed to me, if she's claiming to be a prophetess, right? And yet, of course, with what we read there, she's clearly teaching things contradictory to the will of God. You know, shortly before this book, we read in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, how John said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out in the world. And that's just not male false prophets. Obviously, there were females as well, such as this woman. And it says to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things offered to idols. You know, perhaps that was for the sake of maintaining their jobs. Remember, we, from what we know and the trade guilds and how they were directly connected to gods and goddesses and the and the banquets that would be held and sacrifices that would be offered in connection right with their jobs and professions and making money and providing for themselves and their families. So perhaps for the sake of maintaining their jobs or harmony with the community, this was welcomed or accepted by some. But what we do know is what Christ said here in Revelation chapter 2, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. He held the church there accountable and responsible. You allow that woman, Jezebel, to, seduce, to teach and seduce my servants. Kind of reminds me of what we read earlier in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 5, of the brother who was guilty of sexual immorality. And didn't they allow that for a period of time in their midst? Now, Paul might not have used that same expression as Christ does here, you allow, but he says it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and such, such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles and you're what? You're puffed up, not rather mourned, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So they were allowing it. And as we go on, we read about the little leaven. Leaven's the whole lump and they need to purge out the old leaven, become a new lump. And notice Christ says, I gave her time to repent. But obviously she had not by this point in time. I gave her time to repent. And isn't that true and characteristic of God and of Jesus Christ? That's just part of their intrinsic qualities. Long-suffering. We see it time and time again with Israel of old. We see it with specific individuals and nations. And that hasn't changed, right? Because the Lord gives us time to get our lives right with him to turn away from sin and repent whether that's I haven't obeyed the gospel yet and he's why hasn't the Lord come yet he's long suffering he's not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance second Peter 3 9 or whether that's I'm a child of God but there's sin in my life that I'm allowing and, I, and again he's being long suffering and he repented that I need to turn away from that sin and be faithful to him notice in second Corinthians what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in second Corinthians chapter 7 now, you think about the first letter, and we just began that study in the men's class of 1 Corinthians. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, as, as Paul in that first epistle addressed so many of the problems and sins occurring and, and going on in that church that needed to be repented of and corrected, one of which we just touched upon in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians with the brother guilty of sexual immorality, perhaps that being touched upon again here in chapter 7 as it was in chapter 2, but in verses 9 and 10, he says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. I gave her time to repent, but she did not do it. Why? She, had, she didn't have any godly sorrow. 
if she and others that were participating in, her, in, in what she was teaching and seducing my servants to do, if they had godly sorrow, that, that produces repentance, that leads to salvation. Certainly there's a time for patience. While we teach and try to correct someone in error, but this cannot just be in an indefinite period of time where nothing is ever done. That's not true of Jesus, and it's certainly not true of what He expects of local churches belonging to Him. There comes a time when those who are teaching things that are contrary to sound doctrine, to the doctrine of Christ, Romans 16, 17, that we observe, we've observed them, but we take, we've noted them, we, we, now we avoid them. And as we read in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, you have a brother or a sister who's walking disorderly, and they continue in that way, and they don't repent. What, are, what is the local church commanded to do in the name of the Lord? Withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which you have received from us. So it's not that we don't have any other scriptures to help us as we study text like 1 Corinthians 5 or here in Revelation chapter 2 with the responsibilities of this local church that would have been true for them as well. The Lord had been patient. His patience is running out clearly with what He says here uh, in the verses that follow. And so here's the Lord's warning. I gave her time to repent, but she did not. And so the Lord's going to cast her into a sick bed. So she's going to go from a bed of fornication to a bed of sickness. And furthermore, those who committed adultery with her will have great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Again, note the Lord's long-suffering. He is willing to withhold the tribulation and the retribution, the punishment, if they will repent of their sinful deeds. I'm coming. And this was going to happen unless there's repentance. And so we would, we would hope that when they receive this letter, and just imagine being this church in Thyatira and receiving what Christ had to say here, you would think, as plain as his language is, that might wake them up, at least some of them. I don't know if it would break through to this woman described as Jezebel, but hopefully some of them came to repent as a result of Christ's letter to the church through John the Apostle. He says, I'm going to kill her children, perhaps her followers. As Jesus said earlier, she, she teaches and seduces my servants to commit sexual morality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Those two sins over and over again in God's Word connected to one another, worshiping idols and committing sexual morality. We see it throughout the Bible. We know it in history as well. But kill her children, maybe her followers, with death, with pestilence. And the churches will know that He searches the minds and hearts. It's a reminder, you cannot deceive God. Whatever a man sows, what? That he will also reap. If you sow to the flesh, and some there were sowing to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the Spirit and are obedient to the Spirit's message, God's Word, you're going to reap everlasting life. But be, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What we sow is what we'll reap. Now, a lot of us, a lot of God's people throughout time, and even today, can we deceive ourselves, but we're not deceiving Him. And He is fully aware of what takes place in my life individually, in your life individually, and He knows exactly what went on in those seven churches, and He knows exactly what goes on in churches today. He searches the minds and the hearts, and He's going to give to each, as He says here, according to their works. A verse from the verses that Jude read for us tonight from Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Really, that's a oft-repeated principle of truth, right, throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, that the Lord God will give to each according to their works. As we read a few verses in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2, and in verse 6, 
who will render to each one according to his deeds, as it speaks about the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God in verse 5. Chapter 14 of Romans, verses 10 through 12. Let us read there together, please. Romans 14, 10 through 12. The Apostle Paul asked, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess. Verse 12, So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. And so Christ says to this church, Verse 23 of Revelation 2, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and will give to each one of you according to your works. As he said to each one of them, I know your works. And yet we see the justice of the Lord, how fair he is before he even gets into these terrible sins that they're guilty of. He's still began with commendation, what he could commend them for. But he says, for those who do not follow her doctrine, not everybody there. And that makes sense, especially as we think about how Christ said, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience, and, your, and for your works, the last are more than the first, that there's some, there's some good brethren there. But those who do not follow her doctrine have not known the depths of Satan. As they say, he places on them no other burden. Well, he speaks of the depths of Satan. Those who have not known the depths of Satan. Well, you look at that description again of Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess who's teaching and seducing my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. No doubt that statement or phrase is somehow related to the teachings and practices of Jezebel. That this was, of course, the influence of Satan. It's darkness. It's unrighteousness. You know, for for those who advocate tolerance of error, as some of our brethren have from time to time in various places, various times, to just kind of get along and go along, I ask, is it ever acceptable to tolerate the works of Satan? Just to be okay with that, to shrug our shoulders of that, ignore that. Well, that's not me, that's them. Well, of course it's not. As we read in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 8, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Think about that. Here's one of the reasons why the Son of God came and was manifest in the flesh was to destroy the works of Satan, the works of the devil. And the works of the devil were alive and well in the church in Thyatira. And so it was not okay, obviously. No, as Paul says, let us give no opportunity or place to the devil. And they were in Thyatira. And as we read in the text dealing with the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, And in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? To stand against the wiles or the schemings of the devil. And as Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, he tells Christians that he addressed in that first epistle to be sober, to be vigilant, because why? Your adversary, your enemy, the devil... He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. No, it's never acceptable to tolerate the works of Satan. You have allowed that woman Jezebel. That's not okay. (laughs) 
And so we find here in Revelation 2, in verses 25 and 26, a call to action. He tells them, hold fast what you have till I come. Well, till I come, when might that be referring to? Well, it may have reference to his second coming, till I come, or his coming in judgment upon nations deceived by Satan, Jerusalem or Rome later, or the arrival of judgment threatened here in the text to Jezebel and her children. But hold fast, he says, till I have come. In other words, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Those of you who haven't, right, as he says here in Revelation 2, now to you I say and to the rest of the entire as many as who do not have this doctrine, this is who specifically he's directing this message to, hold fast what you have till I come. He's not directing it to those who need to re repent. You need to repent and then they need to hold fast. But those who don't have and are not involved in this, you hold fast till I, I come. Do not be conformed to this world as they are, but be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind uh, the perfect will of God. And then in Romans chapter 13, Romans 13, notice in verses 11 through 14, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness, as what was going on at Thyatira and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Don't walk in lewdness and lust. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Those are the things they need to continue to hold fast to. As we read in chapter 2 of Romans Again, in the context of Judgment Day, Paul speaks of those in verse 7, eternal life to who? To those who by patient continuance, in other words, holding fast and keeping on and not giving in or giving up, patient continuance, he says, verse 7, in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. And of course, as the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 10, and in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. It's not obey the gospel and live whatever life I want to and compromise with the world. No, it's come out of the darkness to stay out of the darkness and to walk in the light and not compromise and to hold fast. He's faithful. We need to be faithful to him. That's the message. Because he, he who overcomes and keeps my works to the end. Are you there in Hebrews 10? Hebrews 10, verse 36, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Verse 39, But we are not of those who draw back to perdition or destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. You have need, we have need of endurance. Keep on keeping on. Don't, don't fall back, don't draw back. Finish, hold fast. Overcome, continue to keep my works, Christ says to the end. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. That's what in essence what these saints who were still faithful were being told to do. And there's a promised reward. Christ says to him, I will give power over the nations, perhaps in the sense that our righteousness will judge the ungodly. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, taken from Psalm 2, 8 and 9, first messianic prophecy of Psalms, where the Lord ultimately judges the ungodly nations. Furthermore, he says, I will give him the morning star a new beginning, a reward greater than anything this life has to offer. Remember later in the book, Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, Jesus is described as the bride and morning star. 
And then, of course, in verse 29, as we find with all these seven churches, he ends with, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So does the letter to the church in Thyatira, this corrupt church, does this apply to us? And of course it does. There's application for us. You know, you may have a congregation that teaches the fundamental truths, the plan of salvation, proper worship, the work and organization of the local church, em emphasizes evangelism and participates in that. A congregation may be filled with many good works. They, they were, he says your works are more than the, than your, the first, so they were progressing. So it's a church, maybe a church that continues to grow and, and, and make progress spiritually. But a church like this, maybe they allow error. Maybe doctrinal error, immorality to be taught and practiced by some. They, they compromise the truth in given areas, possibly for the sake of unity or, again, to get along. But worldliness around them and in their own families has influenced and weakened them. And they've changed from where they used to be spiritually. In the congregation at Thyatira, there were faithful brethren. There were those that Christ again said to them, as many as do not have this doctrine have not known the depths of Satan. On the day of judgment, we know we'll stand as individuals, 2 Corinthians 5.10, and other passages we've already noticed in Romans. But does this mean that it doesn't matter what a church teaches and practices? I'm going to be judged individually anyway, so it doesn't matter what the group as a whole does. It. Well, absolutely not. Of course it matters. Concerning the faithfulness situation, what are they doing to remedy and resist the unsound teaching? What are they doing? You allow... Think about the church at Corinth. Was it okay even though they weren't specifically involved in the sexual immorality? And in that case, there just seemed to be one brother, not a bunch attached to him like it was at Thyatira. Was it okay with, with Paul and Christ there? No, it wasn't. They were, they were, they were guilty. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You need to put the evil out of your midst. So how much time do we take and how much effort do we make to try and keep the church pure? Well, as long as there is hope and we need to realize that our purity and soundness is essential to Christ and it must be essential to us as we read there in 1 Corinthians 5 and, and purity and morality and abiding the doctrine of Christ in order to have fellowship with the Father and the Son. And if we don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, we don't have fellowship with the Father or the Son. And we're not to receive those who don't abide and remain in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Again, as we, at some point, we know that an unpleasant decision needs to be made, must be made, for we must have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them or reprove them. As we already noted in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, or 1 Corinthians 5 as well, when a brother or sister is walking disorderly, the church must take action for the sake of that person's soul and others involved and the purity of the church and faithfulness, of course, ultimately to our Lord. Let's be reminded as we bring the lesson to a close this evening what Christ said again in Revelation 2.23, And all the churches shall know that I am He who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. As Christ tonight searches your mind and your heart, and my mind and my heart, what does He find? What does He see within us? Does He see a faithful servant or one who has compromised in some way in his or her life, who's become weaker instead of stronger? As He searches your heart and mind, does He find someone who is presently in a lost condition, in danger of hellfire, or living faithfully to Him who just needs encouragement to continue to hold fast. What does He see and what does He find? We know that whatever the case is, if there is sin in my life as a child of God or as one who has not yet become a child of God, we know that He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But there's no better time 
for you or I tonight to get our life right with God or any uh, better opportunity or moment than right now. As we read in Acts 17, 30 and 31, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. There's a great day coming. Are you ready? Have you repented? Have you obeyed the gospel by believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God? Yes, repenting as commanded of us of our sins, turning away from sin, turning to God and humble obedience, confessing your faith in Jesus Christ, being buried with Him in baptism. Have your sins washed away. And as a child of God, the sin of your life, repent. Come back to Him. If you have a spiritual need, would you make it known as we stand and as we sing?